I'm going to talk to you about the union between stability and fruitfulness. The union between stability and fruitfulness. So I want you to jot that down. The union between stability and fruitfulness. In other words, we're going to take these two characteristics that often uh, exist independently, independently of each other. There are some people that are fruitful, but they're not stable. There are other people that are stable, but they don't know how to be fruitful. But we're going to do a wedding today, and we're going to marry the two of them together. And I'm going to show you the, how much better things are when you unite stability with fruitfulness, okay? Uh, I'm going to show you how you cannot produce trust whether it's with a customer or a companion, if you don't have stability and fruitfulness. As long as you're not stable, people are not gonna trust you. You can have spurts of greatness, you can do kind things, you can do good things for a little bit, but trust comes through stability. Until you are stable, people don't trust you. And so if you're gonna have that kind of stability that creates trust, Again, between clients, between spouses, between children, with your parents, it doesn't matter what it is, with your church, with your leadership, or whatever it is, with your boss on your job, you have to be stable. There has to be a union between stability and fruitfulness. To all of you that are on a new job, uh, in a new relationship, in a new church, in a new situation, you have to realize you got a blank sheet of paper and everything that they'll ever learn about you is what you taught them. They have nothing to go by but what you teach them. So if you don't like what they're learning, stop what you're teaching. I, it, when, when I get through with this class, you're going to take over the architectural design of how people see you and how you see yourself and how God sees you and how you relate to God and how God relates to you, and you're going to do it all through being stable. You don't have to worry about being fruitful. You're going to be fruitful. God's going to make sure you're fruitful. You make sure you're stable. Let's go over that again. God's going to make sure you're fruitful. You make sure you're stable. Until you make sure you're stable, God can't make sure that you're fruitful. There, there's a combined effort between those two things that I think are going to be apparent in the Word of God today. And I believe it's going to bless your life. I believe it's going to speak to you in a really profound way. I believe it's going to open up some things. I think it's going to unfold some things. And in the life of somebody, it's going to answer some prayers. So I'm glad you logged into the broadcast today because God is sending your mail here. And I'd hate to drop the mail off and you not live there anymore. I want you to be right at home where you're supposed to be to receive every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I'm in no hurry tonight. I'm not out to excite nobody. I'm in this room, just me and you. We're hanging out together. We're going through the word of God. And I want to teach you some principles about God that I believe will help your life, strengthen you, encourage you, cause you to always abound in the work of the Lord, give you the courage that you need to be able to be strong, to be stable, and to be fruitful. Again, the union between stability and fruitfulness. We're going to be again the gospel of St. John chapter 15 verse 1 through 10. Gospel of St. John chapter 15 verse 1 through 10. And during this time that many of you are in isolation and, and you're, you're practicing social, uh, what do they call it, social distancing and all of that. This giving you an opportunity to really think a little bit, use your head a little bit, slow down a little bit. We're going to talk about some things that's going to bless your life. Are you with me? Good, let's get at it. In the particular text, we are listening at, listening at the, the final words of Jesus to his disciples. And I think final words are important. You know, if I just go home and say something to my wife, I might just say anything, she might say anything to me. But if you tell me this is your last time you're going to get to talk to her, I'm going to say something important. I'm going to say something that really matters. And we're coming up to the summary of the life of Jesus and his final impartation into the disciples that he is depending on to establish the New Testament church. They're not just disciples that he's trying to depend on to come to church or go to a service or sing in a choir or something like that. These are disciples that he is depending on to be the foundation of the church. So he wants to inbred and inbreed in them certain principles and certain practical ideologies that will call them to be a true representation of what he has given his life for. That's a lot. If I'm going to give my life for something, I want you to be a real reflection of what that is all about. And he starts out this way. He said, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. 
Let's just stop right there. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. It is interesting to know that from Genesis to Revelation, from the Garden of Eden all the way to the book of Revelations, you will see over and over there the Garden of Gethsemane all in between, except the greater we fall into the ground and die. Over and over again, you will see God use agricultural metaphors to bring about spiritual truth. So let's look at this for a minute and let's try to understand what God gets out of using agricultural uh, metaphors to bring out spiritual truth. Let us understand that the first thing that the book of Genesis teaches us is that God is a God of seed. The book of Genesis chapter 8 teaches us as long as earth remaineth, there will always be seed time and harvest. I believe it's Genesis 8, 25. So God says these principles are irrevocable, they're immutable, they're everlasting, they're unchangeable. Everything runs up under a system of agriculturalism. All right, let's go deeper. Let's look at the word agriculture. Because when we look at the word agriculture, we begin to get some hint as to what's going on. We're not talking about something that just grows wild. That's not agriculture. Uh, it just naturally, vegetation just grows where, the way it grows. That's not really agricultural. Whenever something is agricultural, it is planted. When something is planted, it means that it would not naturally grow in that environment. It has to be planted there. Agra comes from a word who, which means land or ground, and culture comes from a word that means cult, which means that this is forced on. It is not normal to the ground. It is not natural to the climate. It has to be planted. So when God starts being agricultural, he says, I'm going to plant some things in you that might not be normal to your habitat, but I'm going to bring them about so that you might begin to grow. Say you grew up in the hood, or you grew up in a neighborhood, or you grew up in abject poverty, or you grew up in the country where people didn't have anything, or they didn't do certain things, or they had certain mentalities, and all of a sudden God plants a seed in you that is totally contradictory to your family. They don't get you. They don't understand you. It's because God is an agriculturalist. And sometimes he will plant something in a ground that shouldn't be coming up out of that ground, but because he planted it in that ground, you come up in that ground. And it's a lonely feeling sometimes because you want to be understood and you want to be liked and you want to be appreciated. But in reality, sometimes God wants you to be in an environment that is not conducive to that environment because he has planted you there. He intends for you to stand out there. It is agricultural. In the text today, he, Jesus says, I am the vine and my father is the husbandman. The word husbandman simply means gardener. So he says, I relate to you as a vine relates to branches and my father relates to me as a gardener would to a vine. So none of this is accidental. Now let's, let's dig into that a little bit. Whether you were born through a rape, whether you were born through an accident, whether you were born through a one night stand, whether you know who your mother is or you know who your father is or you don't know who your mother is or you wish you didn't know who your mother was or you wish you didn't know who your father was, it's totally irrelevant to what I'm talking about. God says you are not an accident, you are not a mistake, you didn't come here through some mishap, you are not a joke, he meant for you to be here. You survived after, after all of the sperm cells that were ejaculated into your mother, out swam all the rest. He pre-designed for you to be here. You are not an accident. Maybe your mother rejected you. Maybe your father wouldn't own you. Maybe they didn't stand by you. Maybe somebody left you in a dumpster. Maybe you were in a trash can. Maybe you were put up for adoption. I don't care how your mother felt about you. You are not an accident to God. God predestined, predetermined, and preordained for you to be in the earth. You are not an accident. My father is the husbandman means you have been planted. All right? And now, when we begin to talk about this, it's interesting. Let's, let's go a little bit further because I think, I think this is going to be good. Then Jesus gets to his disciples. He says, every branch in me that bears not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch in me, first of all, Jesus is saying, in order for you and me to hang out, you can't just be around me. You have to be in me. You have to be ingrafted. You have to be connected. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he, being the Father, cuts it away. 
all right? He cuts it away. So you don't have to worry about the Father will cut it away. All those people in your life that are not really real, all those people in the church that are not really real, all those people in the church that are not really connected, you don't have no business cutting people away. You don't know what you're doing. You can cut away somebody that God wants. You can cut away somebody that's up under attack. They've got blight, they've got worms, they've got disease, but that doesn't mean that they're not real. So, so many times when you feel like you've been deputized to cut people out, you've made a mistake. That's the Father's job to handle that. He knows who to cut out, he knows who to let in. And Jesus said, every branch of me that beareth not fruit, he cutteth it away. What does he do? He cuts it away. And every branch in me that beareth fruit, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. So the second category says, even if you are fruitful, you go through cuttings. Yeah. Now that's important for you to understand that. Because a lot of times, you remember when the uh, disciples came to Jesus and said, who sinned? this boy's father or his mother that, that he should be born blind. And Jesus said, neither, but for the glory of God. We're always looking for somebody to blame. And whenever there's a cutting in our life, there's a cutting back in our life, somebody dies in our life, somebody leaves in our life, somebody divorces in our life, somebody hurts us in our life, we always need somebody to blame because we are always trying to intellectualize divine providence. Providence cannot be intellectualized. It just is what it is. And Jesus said, every branch in me that beareth fruit, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, I want to stop here for a moment and I want to deal with something that is pervasive amongst people that hang out together, groups, clubs, families, churches, committees, sororities, uh, offices, and that is a thing called jealousy. Jealousy is born when one person feels like they go through things that other people don't go through and they feel like life is unfair to them. But this text is quite clear, everybody gets cut. Some people get cut completely off, some people get cut back, but nobody in the story goes without being cut. Everybody goes through cuttings in life, all right? So every branch of me that bear fruit, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now both of them got cut, but one of them got cut to kill and the other one got cut to increase. All right? So if you're going to grow, you're going to grow through the cutting to increase. You're going to go grow because you've been purged. You're going to grow because there have been times in your life that you've been cut by. I hate to tell you this, dancing don't make you grow. Shouting doesn't make you grow. Rejoicing in the Lord doesn't make you grow. I know everybody's been teaching this, but praising God does not make you grow. What merely causes you to grow when you endure chastisement, when you endure being cut back, when you endure being purged, that's what causes you to grow. It is not the good times that make you grow. It's the bad times that make you grow, the hard times, the painful times, the lonely times, the frustrating times, the tearful times. Those are the times that really cause you to grow. And God says, if you are growing and you're doing pretty good, the reward is I'm going to cut you back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's how I reward you. I'm not going to let you stay at the level you're at. I cut you that you might bring forth more fruit. Now, listen at the love that's in that. At first, I don't feel no love in that. My mother used to tell me, I'm whipping you because I love you. I had a hard time with that because I thought, if you really love me, you would put that switch down, okay? But God is basically saying the same thing. He said, I'm cutting you because I love you. What, what do you mean by that? I'm cutting you because I love you too much for you to be satisfied with producing on this level when I created you to produce on that level. And so I have to cut you back on the level that you're producing on so that you can discover that you can do more than where you are. That's good, isn't it? I think if I sat down right now, I've said a whole lot. I think if I stop right there, I've already said something to you that caused you to grow. Because we have a tendency to become satisfied with average. But Jesus said, every branch in me that beareth fruit, I purge it that it might bring forth more fruit. So if you're fruitful and you want to bring forth more fruit, you have to be willing to go through, to, through cuttings in order to get to the place that you become more fruitful. Let's talk about fruit. My children, I have five children. They are the fruit of our marriage. They are the fruit of the marriage. They are not just the fruit of me. They're the fruit of the marriage. 
They're the fruit of the union between my wife and I. The offspring is fruit. Anytime you know there has been fruit, there has been relationship. Unless you are the Virgin Mary, if you are pregnant, there's been relationship. Even in nature, if there's going to be peach trees and there's going to be peaches on them, the bees are going to cross-pollinate between one blossom to the other because fruitfulness is a result of relationship. You cannot be fruitful and not be relational. Okay? So if you're going to be fruitful as a child of God, you have to have a relationship with God. Not with church, not with your pastor, not with the bishop, but a relationship with God where you are in communion with him and the offspring of that communion is fruit. I can look at my children and I can hear them talking and I can hear my wife talking and I can hear me talking. Sometimes they sound just like their mother. Sometimes they sound just like me. You know why? We didn't do it by ourselves. So there's a little bit of her in them and there's a little bit of me in them. And so it is with relationship. As God's spirit gets together with your spirit, the fruit that is born in your life is going to have a little bit of both in it in order for it to be effective. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency may be of God and not of us. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So you need not to think that it's going to be all God and none of you or all you and none of God. The fruitfulness that occurs in your life requires a collaborative effort between the two things. You cannot sit back and do absolutely nothing and pray and say, if it's the Lord's will, I'm going to have it. No, this is fruit. You have to be involved. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. You have to be involved. You have to be connected. God is not going to do it arbitrarily without you. He's going to do it with you. These children are going to be born through the union between you and God. They are fruit. Now, if you don't understand that, you might as well close your Bible. Everything else is gone. And a lot of Christians don't understand that. They spend all their life praying on God, to praying to God, asking God to do things, and they don't know that they're not waiting on God, God is waiting on them. Because God is requiring something of you in order for you to be fruitful. Every branch in me that beareth fruit, I purge it, he purges it, meaning the Father, that it might bring forth more fruit. Somebody say more fruit. If you want more fruit, and it's nothing wrong with wanting more. Stop allowing people to make you feel bad because you want more. If you suspect that your potentials exceed your position right now, if you think that you have more potential to go to the next level than where you are right now, shout more fruit. When you shout more fruit, you're saying to yourself, I want my capacity to grow to the level of my vision. I don't want to believe on one level and live on another level. I want more fruit, not because I'm greedy, not because I'm arrogant, not because I'm self-consumed, not because I'm a self-enthroned egoist, not because I'm a narcissistic maniac. I want more fruit because I would hate to live and die and never reach the potential I was created to reach. That's where we are right now. So Jesus says, just because you're connected to me doesn't mean I won't cut you. I will cut you back. You will suffer loss. Not just loss of ticks and balls and lice and things that you didn't want to lose. When you purge something, you cut back even some of the fruit. Some of you have lost some things you know God gave you and you cannot for the life of you figure out how in the world could God take away something like that when I know it was of God and he gave it to me. You're right. You're right. He did give it to you. But he takes it away that it might bring forth more fruit. There's more coming. I know you're grieving. I know you're hurting. I know your heart is broken. I know your emotions are confused. You may even be angry at God. I get that. I understand that. But God wouldn't be cutting you back if he did not have more for you. Are you getting something out of this word? To those of you who are just joining us, we're in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 15, verse 1 through 10. In these 10 verses, we are discussing the union between stability and fruitfulness. Right now, we're just talking about fruitfulness. We're talking about what it takes to be fruitful. We're talking about the submission that we have to have to the cutting process. Everybody has submission to the success part. To the conquering part, we all say yes. 
to the cutting part. We say, oh, no, I don't want that part. God says you cannot be a conqueror if you cannot endure the cutting. In my book, I call it the crushing. There are crushing moments in life. Right now, America is going through a crushing. Italy is going through a crushing. China is going through a crushing. Los Angeles is going through a crushing. New York is going through a crushing. Individuals in that city are going through a crushing. Nobody enjoys going through a crushing. But at the end of the crushing, we ought to come out better than we were before, not equal to where we were before. We want to go from fruit to more fruit, ultimately to much fruit. Are you with me so far? Let's go deeper. Then he says, now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Now you are clean through the word that I've spoken unto you. I spoke this word to wash you. Wash away guilt, wash away anger, wash away resentment, wash away pride, wash away frustration. You are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. You are clean through the word that I've spoken unto you. God gives us a bath through teaching and preaching. He purges our spirit. He cleanses us on the inside by the power of the word. Ye are clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. Throw your hands up and say, clean me up, Jesus. When you ask the Lord to clean you up, he sends a word to clean you up. And what I have learned in life, if you won't hear the Lord through his word, he starts speaking to you through your circumstances. I would rather repent over his word than to have God get into my circumstances. If you don't receive the teaching, you're going to have to go through circumstances that create teaching in your life. You are clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you today? All right, let's go deeper. Oh, it's getting to the good stuff now. Then he says, abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I want you to underline every time you see the word abide. Abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. Abide, abide, abide. We keep hearing it all over again. Abide, to be stable, to be steadfast, to be unmovable, to get to one place and stay there. I can't tell you how many people I see who are not successful today because they try everything and end up with nothing. All you got to do is go on people's Instagram page and read their bio. I'm a photographer, a biologist, a chemist, an artist, a preacher, and a motivator. How are you going to be all of that at 21? Let me read. They have more titles than they have years. You can't be everything. You have to narrow it down to something. You can't be everything. Why do you keep jumping from biology to photography? Now you're taking psychology. Now you're going to do motivational singing. Now you're going to do opera. Hold it a minute. I'm not saying you can't be multi-talented, but I'm saying jumping from thing to thing, looking for immediate success will always lead to failure. You have to stick to, thing, to one thing long enough to be fruitful. Just because you started something and it doesn't immediately respond to you the way you imagined for it to, doesn't mean it won't bless you if you don't invest in it. Invest time, energy, money, training, preparing yourself to be as excellent as you think you are. There's often a gulf between how good you think you are and how good you really are. Back in West Virginia, we used to say, I wish I could buy you for what you're worth and sell you for what you think you're worth. I could live off the profit the rest of my life. A lot of times people deceive themselves into thinking that they're better at something than they really are. That's why you need some people in your life who can tell you the truth. That was not that good. You need to work on that. You could be better at that. That might sound harsh, but in the end, it's a favor. I would rather you hurt my feelings in private than for me to go out there and get embarrassed in public. Okay? So, Jesus is saying this, and it's something I think we need to pay attention to. Abide in me, and I in you. 
as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. Notice that Jesus doesn't talk about stability and abiding in him until he's brought up cutting. He knows you're going to stay as long as you're blossoming. He knows you're going to stay as long as all your bills are paid and everything's falling into place. He said, but I need you to be stable when you're confused and disappointed and hurt and you don't see the benefit and you feel like all your other classmates are passing you up and everybody else gets to lead a song in the choir but you and everybody else gets called on to preach with you. Do you know I was in a church that I only preached twice in in seven years? Twice in seven years. You know what I did most of the time? Clean it up on, on Saturday night. Clean out the baptism pool. Shampoo the rugs. Bishop Jake shampooed the rugs? Yes, I shampooed the rugs for seven years. You have to endure those times in your life when your gifts are not celebrated. Honestly, they hadn't even been fully developed yet. I had to prove that I wasn't serving God for the stage. I had to endure the fact that I wasn't in the spotlight. You aren't a really good preacher till you can listen to another preacher. I always watch how other preachers receive other preachers. Because until you can say amen to somebody else, I don't want to say amen to you. Part of your ability requires that you need to be able to appreciate somebody else being on the stage. And I'm amazed at the people who get on the stage and struggle, and then when they're not on the stage, they won't help the person who is on the stage. It's amazing to me how judgmental you can be when you're sitting out there, and then how unhelpful you can be, and then get up here and want the whole church to explode and go with you. You, you have to learn how to be stable and to be steadfast. And God is saying, I need you to be the most stable when life is the most painful. That's when I need you to be the most stable. And through the divorce, I want you to be stable. Uh, through the layoff, I need you to be stable. Through the downsizing of your home, I want you to be stable. When your heart is broken, I want you to be stable. When you're not being paid what you're worth, I want you to be stable. The challenge sometimes is to be so committed and so focused to what God called you to do that you're stable. And this is something that isn't taught often, and that's why we have people who are 23 years old and been married three times. Because the moment something goes wrong, we're out of there. Oh, I'd have been gone years ago. My wife would have been gone years ago. It would have been a race to see who could get out the door first if we'd have left every time something went wrong. You stay, you abide, you hold on, you endure, you fight back because you cannot be fruitful if you're not stable. Again, we're talking about the union between stability and fruitfulness. You cannot be fruitful if you're flighty. That's what I'm saying to you. That's what I'm saying. Are you getting what I'm saying? I don't mean to get on you, but I mean to get on you. So I'm going to get on you. All right? Then Jesus says, I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him the same, bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Now, whether you noticed or not, we went from fruit to more fruit to much fruit. In just a few verses, we kept graduating exponentially from fruit to more fruit to much fruit. And we could only get from fruit to more fruit to much fruit if we were stable. You will never see what you could be if you quit. You will never see what you could have if you quit. You will never lose weight if you quit. You will never own a house if you quit. You will never have good credit if you quit. You will never get your degree if you quit. You will never finish anything if you quit. You have to stay with it when you feel like I'm a failure, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm too old, I'm too late, I'm too whatever the devil says you're too much of. You will never get to what you're trying to get to if you quit. I'm going to go a little bit deeper with this. Are you ready for me? Okay, we want to go deeper 
because I want you to get something here that I think is really important. And I want to come down here so I can look you right in the face and you can get what I'm teaching to you today. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Now this is the part he wants you to understand. You didn't get there by yourself. You can't do this by yourself. You can't run it by yourself. You can't raise those kids by yourself. You can't hold that marriage together by yourself. You can't manage that department by yourself. You can't build that house by yourself. He says, without me, you can do I, oh, oh, I heard you. I heard, oh, I did it without the Lord. I'm not even saved, and I did it. I went to school, and I got my degree, and I wasn't saved, and I did it. I bought a house, and I wasn't saved, and I did it. You still didn't do it by yourself. You might not have acknowledged him, but he helped you get where you're going. And isn't it a shame that he helped you get there and you gave all your strength to somebody who didn't? Wow. Isn't it pitiful that he guided you to where you are in life and you acknowledge people who left you, cheated on you, lied on you, betrayed you, destroyed you, and the one who's been closer than a brother, you pay him no attention at all. He says, without me, you can do nothing. This is why whatever you give, whatever you sow, whatever you plant, whoever you help, however you love them, you're only giving out of the abundance of what was given to you. Because without him, you would not be able to be a giver. Without him, you could do nothing. You wouldn't have anything to give. You wouldn't, I don't just mean money, honey. I don't just mean money. I mean talent. I mean wisdom. I mean concept. I mean influence. I mean ideas. I mean creativity. Without him, you can do nothing. So he says the important thing for you to maintain is not to become more attached to the gifts than you are the giver. Not to become more attached to the healing than you are the healer. Not to become more attached to the blessing than you are the blesser. Not to become more attached to the things I gave you than the one who gave it to you because without me, you can do what? Nothing, Nothing at all. That, that admission of humility is worship. That is worship right there. That is a prayer life. That's a good way to start your morning. Lord, without you, I can do nothing. I need you to give me wisdom. I'm going to a meeting today. I want you to nudge me when I've said too much. I want you to put a fence around my tongue. I want you to guide me to the most important things to say. And I promise you, Lord, if I give the victory in this meeting, I will give you the praise. For without you, I can do nothing. This is prayer 101 for people who do not know how to pray is admitting your own limitations, humbling yourself before God, opening up your heart before him and saying, God, I'm ready to hear from you. Now, this is Jesus. Remember now, remember, don't forget this. Don't forget this. This is Jesus' summary to his disciples. He's getting ready to leave them physically. And he says, without me, you can do nothing. In the same breath, he said, I'm going away. <laughs> so what does that mean? I'm to do nothing else? No, I'm going to be with you in the spirit. I won't be with you in the way that I was with you, but I will be with you. And what your job is, you are not supposed to make yourself grow. You don't have to do that. You don't have to make yourself be fruitful. You don't have to do that. You don't have to make yourself be taller. You don't have to do that. You don't have to make yourself be richer. You don't have to do that. He says, all you have to do is abide in me and my word abide in you and I got the rest of it covered. Now this is a union that you can't miss up. This, this, this is a relationship, the union between stability and fruitfulness. 
God says, if you be stable, I'll make you fruitful. I've been preaching 43 years. Every year, good years, bad years, big crowds, no crowds, small crowds, lot of appointments, no appointments, didn't make no difference. Big money, no money, don't have any money, can't keep the lights on. I still preach the word with a car, without a car, didn't have a car, picked me up for church, thumb a ride, got to teach Bible class, gonna teach faith, don't have groceries, got to be faithful. You can't get to fruitful if you're not faithful. I made it to fruitful, but I made it through being faithful. Suppose I would have quit. Suppose I preached 10 years and didn't have over 100 members. Give me credit, 10 years and didn't have over 100 members. Suppose I'd have got to my ninth year and said, this is not working for me. I'm going to go sell full of brush. Suppose I would have walked away at nine and a half years and said, you know, if God would have meant to bless me at this, uh, he would have blessed me. I gave him nine and a half years. It wasn't a matter of blessing. It was a matter of being faithful. Because I might not have had a hundred till now, and still that's fine because he counted me worthy at all. You don't measure success the way the world measures success. Once you put your hand to the plow, you don't look back. Once you say yes, you don't say no. Once you sign up, you don't quit. Once you bind yourself, you don't break away. You got to be faithful. You got to be steadfast. You can't get the honey out of the lion. If you're not faithful, you got to stick around. I feel like I'm talking to somebody who's ready to give up. I feel like I'm talking to somebody who feels frustrated and say, by this time, I should have had a blessing. Who are you to decide when the plant brings forth fruit? You're not the husbandman. You're just a branch. Just stay connected and mind your own business. God knows when he's ready to bless you. God knows when your family can handle it. God knows when you're mature enough to handle it. God knows when you've grown enough to handle it. God knows when he can trust you with the blessing. God knows when you're ready to have a door open up. God knows when it won't go to your head. God knows when you won't lose your way. God knows when you won't get strung out on drugs. God knows when you won't lose your mind. God knows when you won't have a nervous breakdown. God knows when you'll hold your peace. God knows who you're able to fight off the enemy. God knows when you can withstand the pressure. God knows when you can fight off the haters. God knows when you can deal with the witch. God yeah. knows when to bless you. Yeah. Oh my God. And until then, all you got to do, baby, is real simple. You don't have to go to college for this. You don't have to take a night class. You don't have to uh, uh, download LinkedIn and read something all night in order to figure this out. It's real simple, abide. Just show up for the fight every day. Show up for the fight. I'm supposed to show up Wednesday at 2 o'clock? I show up Wednesday at 2 o'clock. Just show up for the fight. Do what God told you to do. He said, if you abide in me and my word abide in you. Let's go deeper. This is getting good. If a man abide not in me, verse 6, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. Men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. He said, if you go off on your own, everything you got is going to wither. Men gather them and cast them, and any time men come into it, you're in trouble. Because when men get to execute what they want to do on you, they will gather you and cast you in the fire to be burned. You don't ever want to fall into the hands of the mercy of men because men are ruthless. Men who are just as guilty as you will crucify you for doing what they already did. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying to you. So you want to abide as close as you can in the hands of God because God is merciful. God is kind. God is gracious. God is forgiving. God knows where to prune you. God knows how to correct you. There's a difference between chastisement and child abuse. Other people will abuse you. God will chasten you. 
you want to stay in the hands of God. Can I teach this? Come on, come on. If he abide in me and my word abides in you. Yeah. Oh, this is a loaded gun. You can't handle this. If ye abide, here's the deal. Here's the contract. Here's the clause. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you. Watch this. Here's the promise. Ye shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Oh, that's some good stuff. It, it, it's a simple contract. In one verse, if ye abide in me and my word abide in you, not their word, not the gossip column's word, not your enemy's word, not your mama's word, not your grandmama's word, not the word of your insecurity, not the word of your fears, not the word of your childhood, not the word of your past. If ye abide in me and my word abide in you, ye shall ask whatsoever you will and it shall be given unto you. Good God Almighty. Do you understand the power that God said if you stick around long enough I'll give you enough power that you can have whatever you say. You can ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. It's going to happen because you said how could God give that much power? He said I didn't give it to you when you were a baby. I made you abide. I made you mature. I made you stick around. Had I given it to you early, you would have asked me for somebody else's husband. Had I given it to you early, you would have coveted somebody else's church. Had I given it to you early, you would have asked for something you can't handle. But after I matured you, I could trust you with power. I could release you to another idiom of thought. I could release you to another level of thinking and dreaming. I could give you the kind of power where you can ask what you will and it shall be given unto you. If you believe that right there, that's enough to blow your head right off your shoulders. If ye abide in me and my word abide in you, ye shall ask what you will and it shall be given. Don't have to pay for it. It shall be given. I, need, I don't know who I'm talking to right now. I don't know who I'm ministering to right now. I don't know what you're going through right now. But the Lord is saying you have finally come to a place and a level of maturity in your life that now you can ask what you will. You got enough word abiding in you. And I believe, I believe the real mystery of this text is that if you get the word to abide in you, it will change what you ask for. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, y'all hear what I'm saying. See, if, if you don't get enough word in you, you will ask according to the flesh. But if you get enough word in you, it will change what you ask for. It will change the desires of your heart. It will change what you value in your life. It will change what matters to you. He said, if he abide in me and my word abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be given unto you. God said, I'll give it to you. You won't even have to work for it. I'll give you houses you didn't build. I'll give you vineyards you didn't grow. I'll give it to you if you abide in me. And my word abide in you. Ye shall ask what you will. And she'll be, I, I wish you believed it. I dare you to believe it. I dare you to take that scripture and reach up and snatch it and pull it into your bosom and walk around with it all week long saying, if he abide in me and my word abide in you, you shall ask what you will. If he abide in me and my word abide in you, you shall ask what you If he abide in me and my word abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be given unto you. That word getting down in your heart will change you. It will change the way you think. It'll change the way you live. It'll change the way you react. It will even change what you want. Yes, yes, yes. It will change what you ask for. The things I would have asked for 20 years ago, I don't even want them today. No, Lord, don't bring that today. I changed my mind. I changed my heart. I changed my spirit. That wouldn't give me the joy. What I thought would give me joy doesn't give me joy. Now, I've grown to another level in my life. If you abide in me and my word, abide in you, ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be given unto you. 
everybody was calling me. We were all shut in, you know, the whole city down here in Dallas is, is locked up and locked in and shut down and everything. And all the young people were going crazy. They were saying, oh, I can't stand in this house. It's driving me crazy. I'm about to lose my mind. I said, I understand it. I probably would have felt that way too when I was your age. It's something about maturity that you calm down. You just calm them down. You just settle. It is what it is. It's the difference between young folks. Have you ever been in the hospital? Young folks come to visit you. Old folks spend the night. Yeah. It's not that it's any more comfortable for the old people than it is for the young people. In fact, it's more uncomfortable. But when your priorities yeah. become more important than your convenience, you just settle in. I'll be walking around in the house, in the hospital with the slippers on. They're just walking around, and they'll be doing crossword puzzles, cross their legs, got their blanket over their knee, because they're not leaving till you leave. Them young people will come in, they'll look at you, order some pizza in the waiting room. When they eat that last slice of pizza, they are out of there. See you next time. I'm praying for you. Love you, mommy, dad. It don't mean that they don't love you. They haven't come to the place of maturity where you can lock in. Maturity does something for you. It makes you lock in. I have to stay in this house all month. I'd rather be in the house three months alive than running the streets dead in a week. Yes, sir. Glory to God. I can stay in the house. I can stay in the house. Let me live. I can stay in the house. Say amen, somebody. Then he says, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. And I'm ready to dance because now I'm starting to understand that the power of life and death is in my tongue, that I can speak the word and the mountain will be cast in the sea, that whatsoever I desire when I pray, I believe I have received it and I shall have it, that I can speak to the mountain and the mountain can be moved, that I can speak to the lame man and tell him to take up your bed and walk, that I can speak the word and the power of God will move to light thy kumai, damsel arise, Lazarus has come forth out of your grave. Stretch forth your withered hand. All of a sudden I recognize I can speak the word and it can happen in my life and I'm ready to shout. I'm ready to shout in verse 7. And then verse 8 comes along and says, don't shout first, the Father's going to shout first. Verse 8 says, herein is my Father glorified. Herein, can you imagine God being happier than you about your prayers being answered? God says, I get happier than you. Herein is my Father glorified. I got to get this first back again. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciple. Listen at how your daddy feels about you. He sticks his chest out when your prayers are answered. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. God is happy for you. To all of you that are seeing much fruit in your life, do you know God is happy for you? God has got his chest stuck out. God is proud of you. Why is that not enough? Why do you need everybody to clap for you when God says, I'm clapping for you? Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit so shall ye be my disciples. As I close this word today, I want you to understand this one thing, and I want you to get it in your spirit and in your heart, that God's heart is toward you being fruitful. He wants you to prosper in all of your ways. He wants you to have supernatural increase. He wants you to be in abundance in all of your life. I'm not just talking about money, abundant health, abundant peace, abundant joy, everything you need. God wants it to happen in your life. But before he can give you things, God is not in your life to be Santa Claus. He wants to teach you how to be stable. So we're talking today about the union between stability and fruitfulness. I know we live in a society that teaches that one thing has nothing to do with the other. But in order to be truly fruitful, you have to be stable. If you're raising plants and you keep moving it from room to room, the plant will die. 
If you want the plant to be fruitful, you got to leave it in one place and leave it alone and water it right there. If you're going to put it in the kitchen window, you can't move it from the kitchen window to the bathroom window to the attic to the basement to the cellar and back to the window. No, 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 no. The union between stability and fruitfulness means my feet will be planted in the house of the Lord and I will flourish in the courts of my God. My brothers and sisters, as we close today, I want to pray for you to be steadfast, to be stable. Just to be stable. I'm not praying for you to be famous. I'm not praying for you to be discovered. I'm not praying for you to get a mansion on the hill. I'm not praying for you to get a Rolls Royce. I'm praying for you to come to the point in your life that you are just stable. Stable when the wind blows, stable when it doesn't blow, stable in the rain, stable in the flood, stable in the fire. Just stable. Because if you can be stable, remember what this old guy told you, God will make you fruitful. If you can stand there and do whatever he told you to do long enough. He'll give you fruit in your life. And I know you're raising a child and they seem so ungrateful and so unappreciative, but keep on doing what you're supposed to do and be stable. You cannot control the other person. You can only control you. And if you be stable, it's going to pay off for you. It may not pay off when you want it to pay off or in the way you want it to pay off, but there is a union between stability and fruitfulness that will bless your life. God just wants you to be stable. As I close today, I believe God. The ninth and tenth verse says, As the Father have loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and I abide in love. I close this verse tonight just asking you, stay in love. <laughs> stay in love with your Bible. Stay in love with your God. Stay in love with your faith. Stay in love with your family. Just stay, just stay in love. It gets hard sometimes, I know, I know. They get on your nerves sometimes, I know, I know, I know. I get it, I get it. But just stay there. If you stay there, God will reward you. He'll bless you. He'll give you peace. Can I pray with you tonight? Those of you that have been fluctuating here and there and everywhere and the Word of God found you tonight and you said, you know what? I've been a little bit of everything and a whole lot of nothing and I, I just need to be, I just need to be stable. It would be my privilege to pray for you tonight that, that God would take that runaway spirit away from you. And that you would find the grace to just be stable. Sometimes it's the fear of rejection. Sometimes it's the feeling of inadequacy that makes us run all the time. But whatever it is, you and I are going to lift it up before God tonight. And Father, as I bow my heads tonight, I pray for believers all around the world who needed to hear the union between steadfastness, stability, and fruitfulness. And I pray right now in the name of Jesus. Some of us have never been stable because we were raised in unstable environments. We grew up in unstable homes. We were moved around from school to school and neighborhood to neighborhood. And we've never seen stable before in our lives. But now we're being tested with stability. And I pray God that you would fill in the blanks, dig the footers and strengthen the foundation and make us stable. And I know, Lord, if you make us stable, you will make us fruitful in the areas we need to be fruitful. 
Now bless your people as only you can bless them. In the name exalted above every name, the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Breaking news and it's the kind we don't like. It's a new number. Sure. Shows nationwide are rushing. is a negative stigma that's been associated with mental health. You watch that 24 hours a day on top of all of the other stresses that you have. What is that doing to our mind? Human beings are not designed to be going all the time. Sometimes we need to turn it off.